Now we can go to chapter eight. And yes, okay. So chapter eight is about geometry. And early on, we we, we saw that there was there, there were vector space. If we if we looked at arrows in the plane, we knew that these arrows, where this the coordinates were. At, if we took these vectors, and then we saw these arrows in the plane, where you sort of think of them as having an angle and and a length like this, then um, there's a geometry here, but there's no geometry that we've had so far. We've just dealt with this as a vector space, but we haven't dealt with any geometry. So the question is, how do you bring the geometry in? And also that, that we want to bring it in in terms of the x, y, in terms of the column vectors, so that we can then go to three and four and five dimensional spaces and still have the geometry. So it isn't restricted to being what we can visualize easily with two and three dimensions. So here's the, here's the idea. There's two things. We need um, lengths and angles. And all of geometry follows from that, that sort of idea. Now, so, so we know that over here, that the, we're gonna write the two, two things. We'll, we'll write the letter of the vector without anything over it for the magnitude or the length here. And also sometimes the absolute value symbol with the vector over it. And you know from Pythagoras' theorem that this is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. Okay, so now it turns out that what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a, uh, a product, okay, as um, say V times W here, which you know as the um, dot product, but it's it's um, which you've, it's called the dot product in um, how do you say? We're just going to define it like this. Well, the length. Okay, let me just give the length. Then we'll do the product. Here's the length. So we take the length of a vector v. We generalize this. In three-dimensional space, if this was x, y, z, it would be x, y, z. So let's say if, if we were in R4, then we would say that the length of this vector is going to be the square root of um, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared. So the formula just generalizes to any number of x's. So this would be in a four-dimensional space. So you had like you had four axes, right? And they were all, you know, because just you can't, it's like hard to visualize. So five, so we can have it, we can have a length defined for any number of vectors, right? And this is it's a natural generalization of Pythagoras' theorem. And it works, it works to, although you have to you'd have to demonstrate this. If you take it a, a line any dimensions. It's good. This is going to be, the, and you just figured out what its length was. This would be the formula that you get that's consistent with thinking of, of, of um, Euclidean geometry. Okay, so um, what we can do is then put this in the context of what I just sort of prematurely introduced was we're going to make a product V dot W, okay? And it's the dot product. So the dot product is going to be V1 times W1 plus V2 times W2 plus V3 times W3 plus V4 times W4. And I can just go on forever, right? If, if this is, I mean, this four-dimensional space just to emphasize that it works at all. It, it's just you take the, it's like you're zipping them up. It's like a zipper, right? You're just taking the first of the first, second the second, third with third, fourth, and it's a sum. So you're taking two vectors and getting out a sum, right? Okay, so, and this is the key. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that, uh, some trigonometric stuff that makes sure that, that the following definition works, okay? 
it turns out that this is always going to be equal to the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, so this is what we, this is what we mean. With, you you can also justify this, but this is what we mean by the angle. So the, the cosine of the angle between the two vectors they could be in some four dimensional space. We don't care, right? But, but they're still going to be like a vector here, a vector here, and they're they're we're thinking these lines. And if we look, these two vectors are going to form a plane sitting somehow in some four dimensional space. So there's going to be an angle theta between them, and it turns out that that angle is V dot W over the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W. Okay? So, so we have, and you can see that if I take V dot V, where the angle between if two vectors are the same, then, then what's going to happen is that that cosine um, theta, theta would be one, and you'll end up with um, v dot v equaling v one squared plus v two squared plus v three squared plus v four squared, which equals the magnitude of v squared. Okay. So this stuff that you you you, you might have seen this before, if you if you've taken physics or mechanical engineering. But we have these two. That we, so this is how you can bring in um, the angle and the length up above. Now, what's the point? The point is you can you can calculate the length from the components, and you can calculate the angle from the components, right? So if I get so if you have two vectors, like say v one equals one, two, three, four and V2 equals 4, 3, 2, 1, then I can say, well, we know that the length um, of this squared is going to equal 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is like 16 plus 4 is 20, 20, probably like 30, right? So that means that the length of this vector is the square root of 30, some units. So there's a length. We calculated it from, we have to do any geometry, and then we can figure out what's, what's the angle between these two vectors. Well, we'd have cosine theta. And since um, it's clear that from this formula that, v, that uh, the magnitude of V2 equals the magnitude of V1, right? Because it's just rearranging the four, three, two, one. Okay, so cosine theta is going to equal v one dot v two over um, the magnitude of v one times the magnitude of v two. So we can put in this is going to be one times four plus two dot plus two times three plus three three times two plus four times one over the square root of 30 times the square root of 30, which is going to equal two, three, six, plus six is 12, plus four plus four, um, four plus four is eight, 12 plus eight looks like 20. And this is the square root of three times square root is 30. So it looks like the cosine of this is two thirds, right? So it looks like if I've done this correctly, the, and then you could, then there, there's an inverse function that you can take to, to get the look on your calculator. There's a, this this if restricted in the with theta on the right, you know, between zero and three hundred sixty degrees, or between if with theta between or equal to zero, less than or equal to two pi, because you want to think of this as a function of, of of this radian measure here. Okay, so then you can say well theta equals cosine inverse of two thirds and well, find the angle. Can I just draw it up just a little bit? Okay. Um, so it's 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 the V one times V you say four um, times V two. Oh so it's just all the um okay. So we're asking for what's the if I take this 
vector and this vector here. What's the angle between them? Or, and, and we want to so the angle between we know its length is the square root of thirty, and we want to then say, well, what is the well the angle is going to be uh, v one times v two over this what over the, the magnitudes here. And we know the magnitudes are square, so that we get a thirty in the denominator, and this is just. 4 plus 4 is 8, plus 6 plus 6 is 12, so it's 20, so it comes out nicely as two-thirds. And so we're not actually interested in the angles. I mean, in that set of applications, you might be, so that what we'll, we'll go for is mainly the, uh, we're mainly interested in, in just the cosine. And the reason for that is, what we're especially interested in is vectors that are perpendicular. Right? But here, this is pi over two, which equals 90 degrees, right? If, if two vectors are perpendicular. So what's the dot product of vectors if they're perpendicular? Well, it's equal to the cosine of pi over two times the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W. But what's the cosine of pi over two? It's zero, so this is zero. So the crucial thing is the dot product gives you a test for whether two vectors are perpendicular or not. It, just in case you don't remember this for the cosine, um, if, if I put up a unit vector here, this is the cosine and this is the sine, right? You could, there's, a, there's a silly mnemonic, right? I mean, you know other ones, but here's one. Let's say you're let's say that you're sunbathing on the beach on the on a coast, right? Well, that's sort of like coast, and there's a sign here, right? Well, that's like sign. And then if you if you stay too long, you're gonna get a you're gonna get sunburns, so you'll get a tan, which is a sign um, over cosine. Okay, well, that's a silly mnemonic. But the point is that, the, 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 because, the, and the point of it is, if you have the sun shining down, the cosine is the part that's flat. It's the shadow. If you have, if you had like a light shining down this way, the cosine is sort of the shadow of this piece. So when I move this vector up, you can see its shadow is going to be a point. So the, co and the and it's the length of the shadow. So the length of the shadow is zero. So that's why the cosine is zero. And the sine, is how tall the sign is. And if you rotate the sign upwards to vertical, then it's going to be one. Okay, so so much for trigonometry. So that's what we want all this stuff for. That's the crucial thing that we want to know if two vectors are perpendicular. So, for example, you know we choose. We, I've, we've had this as a basis vector, right? We've had these two things as a basis for R two, and the question is, are these uh, perpendicular. Well, well, you know the you know the standard basis vectors are right because because the dot product of these two is one zero plus zero one equals zero, right? So you're asking if it's still perpendicular. Excuse me. You're asking if these still perpendicular. Yeah. So these are perpendicular, but the question is, are these perpendicular? Yeah. Because if you do if you do the product here. You'll see it's 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 one times one plus minus one times minus one, which equals zero. So these are also perpendicular. Now, if you, if you drew if you drew them geometrically, here's x, here's y, here is one zero, here is zero one, and this one, you see that here is one one. And this is uh, a one minus one. Oh, I shouldn't have drawn. Right, minus one. So this is one minus one. So these are still perpendicular because they've both been rotated by 45 degrees. So they're still, you know, this is still a 90 degree angle. 
So it's just, it, 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 you, you can imagine then that the different bases here are just the different units. So the, the, you can think of bases as different unit, but those aren't unit vectors, right? One, one doesn't have, these have length one, these have length one, but these don't have length one because the, um, the length of this vector is the square root of this one here. So that's going to be um, the square root of two, one plus one plus one plus one. So it's not just the rotation. And that, and that leads to the idea that let's say I wanted the unit vector. So if I want the unit vector in this direction, right, that's going to be the vector divided by its magnitude, right? So for the example, this one, I would have one, one. But when I say divided by, I mean multi, I mean this is multiplied by one over V. So here, this would be one over the square root of two times one, one. And then if I take the dot product of this with itself, it's going to be the one half is going to give me one half. And then the dot price here will give one plus one times one plus one times one will give me two, so I'll have one. So so th then this is this is called normalizing a vector, right? Uh, the word normal has a geometric, so I normalize the vector here. So sometimes you want to have normalized vectors, but they always introduce like weird numbers, like square roots. So you really, so you really want to avoid normalization for most occasions, unless you need it for ap actual applications. Okay, so, but that's not what it, in this thing. There's lots. Of, there's some examples here, but we're really, what we're really working towards is our goal is we want to be able to take a given basis and find an orthogonal basis that spans the same space. So let's say we're given a, a, some space, we have a subspace, and we have a basis for it, but it's not perpendicular. Almost all the bases we found haven't been perpendicular, they haven't been perpendicular to each other. But let's say we wanted to find it, we're all, it was the same space, it spanned the same space, a basis for the same space, but where all the ve basis vectors are perpendicular to each other. So we have to we have to sort of make them so their dot products are all zero, right? Now to do that, this is what we 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 need to be able to do. Is we need to be able to take a given vector v, right? And we and here's another vector w, right? And what would, uh, let me use, let me use the same notation that the textbook is using so you can, these pictures. This is gonna be v, and this is gonna be s, okay? And, and so what we wanna, I don't want S to be quite, oh yeah, okay, so that's okay. So the point is we want to be able to find, so these four plane, right? So we want to be able to find this vector here, right? Because if I choose S as my first vector and I choose this so it's in the same plane as the V and W, it's going to end up spanning the same space, but it's going to, but this vector here is going to be perpendicular to this one. Well, what do, we, what do we want to do? We want to drop this this vector here, which we're looking for, which I put in squiggles here. We, it has to drop down here. We want this angle to be perpendicular, right? Pi over two or 90 degrees. But what, it's, it's, so we but to do that, what we need is, with this vector, with the, we need to find but this length here is, right? Well, this is going to be along S. It's going to be some number, right, C times S. In this picture, we'd have to, it'd have to be smaller. It would have to shorten S because we're looking for the, the piece here that just goes up here, right? Now, what is this vector here? Well, it's going to be V. It's going from here to here. So, you can, you can think of here, if I start here and go here and start here and go here, that's going to be CS plus, let's, let's call this V perpendicular. 
just it's, it's related to v, but so if we add this vector and this one, we're going to get v, right? So we've shortened the s up. So we've taken, so if we take the vector from here to here, then we put it, the tail of this vector here, if you remember your addition where you add two vectors like this, gives you the, the, this one here, right? You have a, b, and this is a plus b. Okay, so this first vector is some number. We don't know this number yet. We're trying to, we want to find this number. C times S is here. We want V perpendicular, we perpendicular to S. That's why I called it V perpendicular. But if I add them up, I get V. Okay? Now, what the crucial thing is that we want, um, we, we, we know S and we know V, but we want to find V perpendicular. So V perpendicular equals, equals V subtract minus S minus C times S. So this is what we want to find. This number here is called the um, um, okay. Well, this piece here, right? There's two things we could find. This is, we call this V parallel. Um, we need to find, um, we need to find C. And we want, and we want, okay, uh, there's two pieces here. I sort of went in two directions at once. Um, this piece here, V minus CS, is called the orthogonal projection. Of W on S. Now, you, 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 just in case you've had some physics before, you know, if, if I took, this is a displacement, right? And I had a force here like this. And I took the, the dot product of the displacement and this. So, I get, so the projection of F along this direction here is called the work. But it, so it's, this is what we're looking for. This is like, we're looking for the part of F that's along this, this line here. Just in case you, if you haven't seen this, that's not a big deal. We're looking for the part of V that sort of lies along the direction S. That's the C, S. We have to find C. So now, the, our, well, we know that V perpendicular is perpendicular to S, right? So if we do S, um, dot V perpendicular, that's going to equal S dot V minus S dot C S, right? I just dotted both sides. Now, and the crucial thing is, these are supposed to be perpendicular. That's the condition. So we want, we want S and v so we, we, we don't know what v perpendicular is. We can say, well, this side is zero because they're perpendicular. So we have zero equals s dot v minus c s dot s. And then if I bring this to the other side, I have c s dot s equals s dot v. And c, that constant I wanted to find, was the dot product of S and V over S dot S. So that's that's the goal of this maneuver, okay? You're not going to move on. This is just showing you that it, it's, it's, it's just a calculation, okay? So the orthogonal projection here, which is the C times S, right? C times S. This is the this is the projection. It's going to equal s times v over s times s 
Um, times s, right? And this is this is this formula here. Yes, so this is yes. We we will be interested in the next section in v perpendicular. Okay. But the, the problem is to find so then so what what's it, so but this enables us. See, now we know what C is. So if we wanted to know what V perpendicular was, is, it would be, right, up here, we know V perpendicular is V minus C times S. So it would be minus, um, turn this around, V dot S over S dot S times S. Okay, well, this is going to be the next chapter. This is where I'm, this is the, the key thing. So in this section, the whole point was just to find this orthogonal projection, just to find this, the, the, the flat piece, not the perpendicular. This is V, think of this as V parallel, or maybe not V, that looks like equal sign. Think of this as V parallel, that we've divided, we've divided, We've divided sort of, there's a piece that's parallel to S, the piece that's perpendicular to S that add up to V, and we've just found V parallel, which is the projection, okay? And the key is the, is the C. So this is V parallel, the orthogonal projection. So, so okay, so that's the... Um, that's the goal here, okay? Let's see. Um, let me go through. Let's find. Okay, so for example, we we could we could look look do an example here and say what is the what is the part of two one that's along that's along the second vector here? This is on. This is on. Um, what page? Page 436. Okay, so, so what's, what's the part of if V equals this and S equals 3 dash 2, then V parallel, that's the orthogonal projection, it says project the first vector. Or See, so it says that the words they're using are onto the line spanned by the second factor. Okay. Well, this is along that second direction. So what what we um, need to do is V parallel is going to be uh, V dot S. Um, why am I going uphill now? Okay. V parallel equals v dot s over s you know s dot s is the magnitude of s squared so so one of the magnitudes here makes this into a unit vector the other one makes this into a unit vector so you can think of this conceptually as what we've done is we've found the we've found we've projected v we found the unit vector along this direction and then projected v under the unit vector so we get the the part of v that's along the direction that's sort of the idea if you, that's what the, the purpose of these two S's down here. Well, we can then do the calculation here. V dot S, this is going to be 2, 1, dot 3, dot 2, over times 3, 2. Okay. So I can do the numbers, like here, there's a fraction out front. Well, this is two times three is six, minus two is four. And the bottom we have three times three is nine um, plus four. Nine plus four is 13 and three, two. So there it is, V 
That's the orthogonal projection. Now, the claim is that that yeah. So that's this. So there. So it's this is this. That's just it. If we did the two times three is six minus two is four. Two times three is nine. Plus four is thirteen. Okay. Nothing simple happens except maybe the four and the two, but still, that's there's no arithmetic simplifications for this one. Okay, and there's some other there's some other kind of problems they have here when you deal with lines and things like that, but that's not I'm not gonna we're, we're not gonna worry about those too much. What we want to be able to do, and that's basically all there is to this this chapter is dot product. Um, length of a vector, angle, and orthogonal projection. So we just need to be able to calculate those things as a as a basis for going on to to saying, given a basis, find a a, um, a, a um, how do you say find a orthogonal basis. Okay, so are you guys okay with this? We can, you know, it's not. This is just. More like traditional math that you've had, where you just have you have three little procedures or concepts, and you just do the calculation. So let's then we can go now and see how this is applied in the second half of the next chapter. You skip all this basis stuff, and you come to. Okay, you come to orthogonal bases, right? It's on page 458. So here's this is the classical method. Let's, let's start with an example. It's pretty much the best thing to start with an example. Let's say that I have this basis, basis B for R2, and I want to find an orthogonal basis. Well, of course, we know there's a standard basis, but that, but that, but that's there's a procedure that where you don't have to know anything about what it is. And so maybe in other spaces, this will be a subspace and you won't, there won't be anything obvious about it. Well, this is um, V1 and V2. And you can see that V1 dot V2 is equal to um, two plus two, which equals four, right? Um, and so that's not equal to zero. So they're so they're not perpendicular. Okay, so what we'd like to find is is a perfect. No, let me use the same letters that they use here. Um, oh, campus. Okay, so we're looking for a, an orthogonal basis of kappa one and kappa two. They look like Ks. I think if you wanted to really, you'd have to sort of put little curvy lines there to make them to look like kappas. Okay, so the idea here is this. The procedure is this. We choose one of the vectors here to be kappa one. Let's just choose V1. So we can choose kappa one to be V1, which equals here one, two. Then we choose kappa two to be V two minus that projection, minus the projection, that projections. So this is minus, um, minus V two dot V one over V1 dot V1 times V1. So this is the orthogonal projection of V2 on V1, and we're subtracting it off from V2. So this is the perpendicular. So therefore, this vector and this vector are supposed to be perpendicular. Right? Now, it shouldn't matter what the vectors are. These should be perpendicular no matter what V1 and V2 are. Let's see if that's true. Okay? Let's take the dot product of kappa one dot kappa two. Okay, so it is V one dot 
V2 minus V2 dot V1 over V1 dot V1 times V1, right? Just plug this in here. Well, this, I can multiply this in. We haven't shown that, but the dot product distributes over sums like this. So this is going to be V1 dot V2 minus, now this is a number, so this is going to be V1, I'll just repeat the number, V2 times V1 over V1 dot V1. This V1 comes and dots this V1. And then you see the whole point is this cancels that, and I have V1 dot V2 minus V2 dot V1, and v, v, these dot, the order doesn't matter, so this is going to equal zero. So they're necessarily perpendicular. Okay, so we, we can go then and, and calculate kappa two here. Um, we repeat the formula down here, that kappa two equals our V2 minus V2 dot, oh, and actually here, it should be uh, kappa one over, Kappa 1 and V1 are the same, but let's call it Kappa 1 now. Because this, this makes sense later on. Okay. So, this is, V2 is 1, 2, minus, um, make sure if that's correct. Oh, no, 1, 2, 2, 1. So, V1 is 1, 2. V2 is 2, 1, minus, so this is um, 2, 1, dot 1, 2, over 1, 2, dot 1, 2, times 1, 2. Okay, so this equals 2, 1, minus, this is 2 times 2 plus 2 is 4, over 1 plus 2 times 2 is 4 is 5, times one, two, which equals two minus four fifths over one minus eight fifths, right? So this is two minus four fifths. Well, the two is two equals, um, 10 fifths, so 10 fifths minus 4 fifths is 6 fifths, and 1, and one is 5 fifths, 5 minus 8 is minus 3 fifths. So, kappa 1 equals 1, 2, and kappa 2 equals 6 fifths minus 3 fifths, which is going to be easier to write as 1 fifth times six is minus three. Okay, now the question is, are these perpendicular? Kappa one dot kappa two, this is a check whether I did the calculation correctly or not. Dot one fifth six minus three is gonna equal one fifth times one times six plus two times minus three, which equals six minus six, which equals zero. So they're perpendicular, it worked. Well, this is called, this is this is the classical orthogonalization procedure. It, it has two names approach, attached to it, but we won't mention them because, because they're both Nazis. Uh, wait, say what? The two the two people that that developed this procedure were were essentially Nazis uh -oh. in World War II. So why give them credit? Okay, I think it, anyway. So much in the, so in the dot products, you have to I mean, you factor out the one fifth, but that scaling shouldn't affect. Yeah, the scaling the scaling comes there, but and the point is though that that. Um, I could, like when you check, I could, I could, 
I could then say, okay, well, look, I'm going to choose six minus three instead of one fifth. But one fifth, but this one fifth is the thing that fit, figures in with the uh, with the um, for, with this procedure. Right. I got. I'm just saying when when you check to see if like if you're double checking yourself to see if they're perpendicular, and you you can ignore the one fifth, right? No, you have to. That's it. You no. The answer. This is the answer. Right. Yeah. No. That's the that's happened too. Kind of two. I'm saying with your, when you're double checking yourself, like there is, if you're dotting K, K1 and K2, right? Um, one, two is going to be perpendicular to six, negative three. Right. So the point is, though, that the goal was to find the classical. So now our, our new basis is going to be kappa one, kappa two. And kappa two yes. has the one fifth. Yes. That's all. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, if you were using this, you would get rid of the one-fifth for sure. But if, if you're quoting the answer, then you want to keep the one-fifth like in the homework problem. Right. Just Okay, now, of course, that was the easy one, right? Then if we go on and let's say, well, how do we, what if the thing was three-dimensional? So we would have, we would have, say, V1, let's say we had a basis B would be V1, V2, V3. Well, we're going to choose kappa 1 equals V1 again, say. And kappa 2 is going to equal V2 minus V2 dot kappa 1 over kappa 1 dot kappa 1 times kappa 1. That's the same thing we did before, right? But then the new thing is we need kappa three. Well, that's going to be V three. Now we have to subtract off the part of V three that's along kappa one minus V three dot kappa one over kappa one dot kappa one times kappa one. But we also have to subtract off the part of V three that's that's per, that is. Um, not perpendicular to kappa two. Right? And you can see that if you, if it was four dimensional, you'd have a kappa four, which would be V4 minus the projection onto kappa one, minus the projection onto kappa two, and minus the projection onto kappa three. And you could just keep going and, and you'd see that you better put it on a computer. So you don't have to go crazy. Okay, well, let's try this in for, for let's let's do an example to see how it works out. Um, let's let's try my basis as one zero zero, one one zero, and one one one. Okay. So there's my v1 v2 v3 and so i'd say well kappa 1 equals v1 equals 1 0 0 and then kappa 2 would equal 1 1 0 minus 1 1 0 dot 1 0 0 over 1 0 Zero dot one zero zero times one zero zero. Okay, it's the it's the 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 the, the um, we've taken the second vector and subtracted off the the part that was not perpendicular, and so then this is one one zero. Minus well, this is going to be one over one, right? One. We see one over one times one. Okay, which equals zero one zero. So kappa two equals zero one zero, which is obviously perpendicular to kappa one, right? 
And then we can do kappa 3, which is going to be equal to 1, 1, 1, minus, we need 1, 1, 1, dot 1, 0, 0, over 1, 0, 0, dot 1, 0, 0, times 1. That's the, the orthogonal projection onto uh, 1, minus 1, 1, 1, times the second one, which is not, not V2, but it's going to be 0, 1, 0, over 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, times 0, 1, 0. So, and that's going to equal 1, 1, 1, minus 1 divided by 1 times 1, 0, 0. And this one's going to be minus 1 over 1 times 0, 1, 0, which equals 1 minus 1, 0, 0, minus 0, 0, 1, which is going to equal 0, 0, 1. So this, this, so this, the, if I start with this particular basis, this classical orthogonalization procedure produces the standard basis. But, but thereby, it gives you a simple practice for doing the, the calculation. Okay, so let me...